Welcome. Welcome to Every Church, a Peace Church, a program that promotes the belief that the church could turn the world towards peace mm. if the church lived and taught as Jesus lived and taught. My name is Don Edwards, and I'm welcoming you back to another program where we discuss issues of peace, justice, um, and uh, we've got a, a, a real important topic to talk about uh, today. Uh, oftentimes, if you've been a uh, regular viewer of this program, we've had guests to talk about the issues of war and peace and the commandment for us to be peacemakers. Um, as difficult and challenging as it is sometimes to serve out that duty as a Christian, mm -hmm. I've always felt that one of the most important and one of the most challenging responsibilities of being a Christian is serving the poor and serving the least of these. And to the extent that I have not had the, uh, enough guests to talk about that part of the gospel, uh, I apologize, and we certainly are going to make up for that today with our guests, uh, Murphy Davis and Ed Loring, mm -hmm. uh, founders of the Open Door Community. And I want to welcome you to every church, a peace church. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, there is so much to, uh, I mean, you, you come to this program with so much dedication. Um, and a commitment to uh, serving out the gospel and mm -hmm. as it's commanding us to do mm -hmm. in terms of serving the least of, uh, of us. And uh, the, the work that you do is, is acknowledged but not acknowledged enough. So mm -hmm. I, I want Thank to you. again uh, welcome you to every church peace church and allow us to know a little bit more about the open door community and just what you do um, both of you are, are uh, retired ministers right as of Saturday as of Saturday <laughs> <laughs> so, so recently yes I see yeah. well great tell, tell um, uh, our viewers a little bit Murphy if you can about the open door community when did you find uh, uh, find it, found it, and um, tell us about what it does. Okay, thank you. Um, we've been on Ponce de Leon Avenue, main, main drag in downtown Atlanta, uh, since 1981. Uh, we moved there after uh, six years. Ed had been pastor of Clifton Presbyterian Church, and I had for several years been working with a little office of Southern Prison Ministry in Georgia and we had worked with a lot of folks in the neighborhood of Clifton Church for several years and had been begun working with people on death row in Georgia and women in prison and as we continued in that work in 1979 we opened along with some other folks from around town and several members of the church we opened Clifton as the first free night shelter in Atlanta and so as we we didn't know anything about what we were doing we were just trying to to figure it out as we went along and after a couple of years of doing that at Clifton we felt very moved by the model of the Catholic worker movement mm -hmm. uh, founded by Dorothy Day and Peter Morin in the depression years 1933 um, and we we wanted to kind of move in with the work and to do the work among the homeless poor and the prisoner from the base of of intentional community mm -hmm. and so that was when we left Clifton and with the help of Atlanta Presbytery we were able to purchase the building on Ponce de Leon it's an old apartment building about 62 rooms in the building and there are Oh, usually 20 to 30 people, those of us living in the building. I think we're about 25 right now. Mm -hmm. The oldest is close to 80, and the youngest is uh, four years old. And Five so, today. Oh, that's right. She has her fifth birthday today. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lively household. We are um, probably about half of us are folks who have come from the streets or from prison and another half are folks who are either short-term volunteers or, or like Ed and me, people who have, 
come there to make this the life work. Uh, so out of that community where black and white and brown, women and men, gay and straight, um, you know, some people with PhDs and master's degrees and others who don't know how to read. Uh, so we're, we're a community of real diversity. Some of us who have never had known involuntary hunger, some who have, um, who have, have grown up by the hardest and have known hunger on a regular basis. So out of that diversity, we struggle as a household, as a community, uh, to, to cross over those huge barriers of race and class and gender uh, that have divided us and that continue to divide us. And then out of that struggle, we uh, serve the poor, we, we provide meals and a place to get me, uh, mail, um, visits to prisons, advocacy for prisoners, um, you know, just try to meet the some of the direct needs of our homeless and hungry friends. And then we do political advocacy out of what we learn. When we hear the cry of the poor, we try to take that into the political arena to advocate for housing for the homeless. There's no reason for homelessness in this society. There's no reason for hunger. Uh, those are political issues of the political will. So we advocate for hungry and homeless people, and we advocate for the abolition of the death penalty and the insane use of prisons and the racist and class-hating use of prisons and jails in our, in our society. Mm -hmm. Ed, your, your husband, Ed, um, mm -hmm. Uh, tell us again the, a little bit more about the, the, the really the commitment when I have went there um, there is a a commitment um, that it's not just rich white folks coming in uh, for an hour um, you know to hand out sandwiches and then go back um, explain the, the nature of the commitment there in the open door community mm -hmm. and, and uh, um, what, what is the, the vision that you mm -hmm. see about, mm -hmm. about what you're doing? Well, the nature of the commitment itself is, is comes out of faith and it comes out of a belief that Jesus is the Prince of Peace uh, and we are to follow him. It is our belief uh, that Jesus is among the most, uh, among the most, if not the most, radical human beings ever to live uh, in history. Uh, there are others who mediate uh, the truth and life of Jesus in our lives, and Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is primary among that, as Dorothy Day Murphy has already uh, mentioned. One of the things that we believe about uh, the United States of America, our culture, and our political, domestic, and foreign policy is that it is about death. That it is about slavery, that consumerism uh, is an idolatry in which ultimately uh, the consumers are consumed by their consumerism. Uh, so one then looks and listens and reads scripture and takes the Eucharist in ways that would lead to life, uh, to an abundant life, to a life of liberation that would lead us out of uh, Pharaoh's slavery. I think the way to do that because of the American affluence and because of the fractures in American history beginning with Native Americans and then African American slavery, the kind of oppression that has gone on with women, with immigrant uh, populations and others, is that there has grown up in the last 350 years in the United States precious pearls of love and wisdom among the poor. Mm -hmm. So that if one should be such as myself, a white male of privilege, it is the understanding of our commitment uh, that we must, number one, begin to reduce our distances, a renunciation of privilege uh, insofar as that is possible for me in my whiteness. Now, it's not complete because I walk out this room, I'm a white man. When the police look at me, they'll see a white man. Uh, so I cannot renounce, renounce my privilege completely, but I can use my privilege 
in ways to reduce the distance between me and panhandlers, between me and people in prison, between me and the people who walk the streets of Atlanta crying and dying uh, because they are abandoned and homeless. Mm -hmm. In the reduction of, a, of the distance, in a journey, a salvific journey across a wilderness land as the Hebrews before us uh, did, uh, the, then the quest or the vision, as you asked, Dr. King calls it the beloved community, the reign of God, the kingdom of God, that kind of vision uh, of wholeness and shalom would then be the movement of reducing the distance into the solidarity of life with the victims of history, with the poor. The victims of history are always victims of war. It, are, it is the rich and the powerful and the social policies to more centralize uh, power and possessions that we create war, for which we create war. And so that when we feed the hungry, we're undoing the consequences of war making and war hunger that uh, resists particularly among the rich the highly educated and those others who have come to believe that the American way is the American way of life. It is the poor that will reveal to us it's the American way of death. Mm -hmm. So, quick synopsis. Mm -hmm. We come to this scripture, to this Jesus, to this radicality, to this call to be a radical remnant in the pursuit of an abundant life. We find that the resources in American history, because of the affluence and the oppression, resides with the poor. We take steps that are risk-taking, that are courage demanding, that are life demanding, and we reduce the distance with our, from our privilege into the lives of the poor. We go into the prisons, we go out on the streets, we go into the insane asylums, we get medical care at Grady Memorial Hospital, and in those places we hear the call of God for peace and fullness that is mediated to us in the victims of this ferocious, war-making culture and society in which we are. Die. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> I understand completely. And what you are modeling is really what Jesus is was teaching and acting out. Mm. We try and, to do that. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, sir. How? Why is that not extended on to the greater church? Why are not all churches speaking and acting? as you have spoken and acted and as Jesus has spoken and acted what what is what is keeping what is cre keeping the christian church uh in large part from following uh the model of Jesus the model of king the model of the open door community what's keeping that what's 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 the what's keeping that uh, the distance I think they're fundamentally two things. One thing that has happened in since the founding of the United States, uh, even in colonial America, is there's been a deep confusion between the will of God and uh, the walk of Jesus and the American nation. So that to be a good citizen was to be a good Christian. Whereas, in fact, uh, the New Testament and Jesus' life in the early church was born in resistance uh, to Caesar and in resistance to the empire. And we have confused uh, God and country. So one of the abominations that happens in this uh, country is that you go into a Christian church and there's an American flag. Jesus Christ died so there would be no nationalism, there would be no boundaries. And we have church after church after church that teaches its children to pray the pledge of the allegiance to the flag. Mm -hmm. To go to Iraq and in the name of Jesus kill Iraqis, go to war. Jesus Christ was a peacemaker. And we have been befuddled, we have been confused, we have been miseducated, we have been threatened, we have been put in prison to make the object of adoration, the object of security, not the cross of the risen, crucified Messiah, but the nation. Yeah. And that's idolatry. And then number two has been the power, the power of affluence. Every person in their human flesh wants comfort. 
That is an issue we must all deal with. The origin of slavery in the human community was, I don't want to bend over. I want somebody else to bend over for me. I don't want to clean the toilets. I want somebody else to clean the toilets for me. That's the origin of oppression. It's comfort. And what America has in a way that no country, no nation, no economy has ever had in human history is the productive capacity by sucking off the raw materials of the third world and the poor to make us comfortable. And so people go to church and they sit in pews in air-conditioned office and they're fed pablum. <laughs> and they go out and they work hard all week and they accrue possessions. And Christians have become cowards. Christians have become soft of flesh. Christians have become deaf to the cry of the poor, blind to the suffering of humanity because they love their nation and they will kill Iraqis for their oil so they can drive faster in the high occupancy lane. <laughs> so that's what I think. <laughs> well, Murphy, uh, You've been married to Ed for 31 years, is that right? That's right. right. What's, what's it like to live with John the Baptist? Oh, well. <laughs> it is not a boring life. <laughs> it's not a boring life. Uh, well, he, he preaches. Uh, I, I haven't heard a, a, a Presbyterian preach like that. Yeah, right. I guess, I guess. <laughs> but um, uh, tell us some of the... the um, uh, the, the, the political actions that you, that mm -hmm. you do. Um, I, I know you, for example, and you, in, in perhaps some of the other uh, activities that the Open Door does. Mm -hmm. um, I know you sponsor regular uh, prison visits. Mm -hmm. Tell mm -hmm. us, tell us mm -hmm. about that. Well, um, there's several of us in the community who are ordained ministers, and we're able to go in and out of the prisons and jails with a bit more freedom than, than lay folks. And so uh, we do, Ed and I have for, it's getting close to 30 years now, uh, visited on death row on a regular basis, um, which has meant that we've accompanied a number of people. Um, it's 30, 34 now folks, I think, who have been executed in Georgia since 1983. Um, and I've been with a lot of those folks, and Ed as well, um, right down to the time of their executions, uh, which is a very painful journey, of course. Yes. Um, but there are a lot of our folks in the community who also visit individuals on death row, um, and we do a lot of uh, jail visitation. Our homeless friends are in and out of jail for incredible crimes like public urination or criminal trespass for sleeping in an abandoned building. Um, we expend enormous public resources jailing people for what are basically status offenses. Um, how do you have a law against public urination or public defecation uh, and acknowledge that there are at some 20,000 homeless men, women, and children in the city, and there are no public toilets. Mm -hmm. But people do jail time for public urination. Uh, so we use all those resources at the back end when we could have funded public toilets all over the city, many times over, mm -hmm. uh, for the many years that, that we've uh, prosecuted that crime and call that a crime. Um, so out of our visitation with individuals and getting to know their lives and what it is that has brought them to jail or prison, uh, that's how much of our advocacy grows uh, because you come to see that our, our society's hatred for the poor is best shown in the way that we use our prisons and jails. Yeah. Prisons and jails are for poor people, and primarily they are for poor people of color, which in Georgia means African American. And there's no time nationally um, or in this state where the prison system is not some 70 percent black. Mm -hmm. um, let me 
change gears a little bit, uh, Murphy and, and Ed, if you, uh, if you permit me. Uh, Murphy, you've undergone some difficult times in terms mm -hmm. of your personal mm -hmm. health, and I thought it might be uh, good for, uh, for some of our listeners who are also undergoing some very significant mm -hmm. health challenges. Uh, you stare death in the face. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about that experience? Sure, sure. Well, like growing numbers of people in our society, I'm a, a cancer survivor. Um, I was struck, I've, I've been through cancer three times now, um, and I was told in 1995 that I had six to 18 months. So I consider the last, uh, the last 11 years, almost 11 years, um, just to be a wonderful, wonderful gift. Yes. Um, I was um, diagnosed in March of 95 with Burkitt's lymphoma which is a cancer that is particular to boys and young men in the low-lying tropical areas of East Africa. Hmm. Now, wow. now <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Nobody's really explained that. Um, but what we do know is that the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, of which this is one mm -hmm. of, of many, um, the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas are growing in the United States, um, and they don't know for sure, but it seems to be associated with pesticide use. Uh, we're poisoning our earth, you know, just as we're, ha we're carrying out a war on the poor, we're carrying out a war on the earth itself. And we know we're poisoning the earth, and we know that we eat poisoned food and drink poisoned waters. Um, but we don't yet have the political will to put a stop to that. Mm -hmm. And so I think all of our bodies are beginning to tell us that something is wrong. Um, the great adventure that um, was in store for us is that when we moved to the open door, the four of us who were founders um, decided that we could not serve and try to live in solidarity with the homeless poor uh, and have access to privilege. That would separate us very quickly. So from the beginning, none of us who live at the open door have salaries or savings or any kind of insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, and that includes health insurance. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a kind of theoretical move in 1981. But when I got very, very ill, and we said that we would depend on the same medical resources that homeless people have, um, we, uh, of course, knew that, that we would have to put that to a test at some point. And in 95, when I had to have emergency sur surgery and then was diagnosed uh, with cancer, I was at Grady Hospital. Um, now, Grady Hospital saved my life. I went through serious uh, surgery, very, very extensive surgery in 1995 and in 2001, and then um, rigorous chemotherapy. Um, the third time the cancer recurred, uh, it was decided my, by my Grady doctors that I needed a bone marrow transplant, and at that point I was transferred to Emory. So I have for the last year and a half been at Emory uh, because Grady does not have a bone marrow transplant unit. Now, the interesting thing there is that I was not qualified by the federal programs as disabled until 2002. So if Grady had not been there, I would not, live, would not have lived long enough to have become disabled mm -hmm. in 2002. So I receive Medicaid now, and um, all of my health care has been because of that program. So when Washington talks about cutting the Medicaid programs and cutting the, the Medicare, um, this is, for me, not only an issue of my love for the poor, it is my own issue. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, is, is very important mm -hmm. about solidarity, that if we really pray for it, if we really um, structure our lives for solidarity, then the prayer will be answered. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of, of what, um, what is intended in the, 
the whole quest and the whole prayer for solidarity is that we love the poor in a way that the poor become our family. So um, my medical journey has really fleshed that out for me in a wonderful way. When in 1999 it was decided that the poorest of the poor at Grady would pay a $10 copay for every medication and all the medical supplies, I knew in my own flesh what that meant. Mm -hmm. It was not just the elderly women who went to the picket line with us. It was me and all of us together. And so um, that's been a really blessed journey, mm -hmm. uh, that, that that has um, come together for us. And I was sort of taken into the fold by my friends on death row mm -hmm. in 95 when they would write to me and say, the whole cell block is praying for you, and we figure now you really know what we're going through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have your own death sentence, and you are really one of us. Mm -hmm. um, that was a wonderful answer to prayer because we sought ways to become family with the poor, mm -hmm. and that prayer was answered. Yes, absolutely. Uh, not only by them, but by many, many who know you, uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, Murphy. Uh, I gotta stay. Yes, yes you stay. <laughs> uh, uh, I would say uh, your sentence has been commuted uh, Thank to you. life. Thank you. It's very, very difficult. There's nothing as difficult uh, to me as as as, uh, as doing the type of work that you do, and you do it. I mean, I mean, you're there in doing it. You are. You are. Uh, you've made yourselves a part of the poor. Um, um, just as it's been com commanded by some of the prophets to, to, to sell everything and, and to be amongst the poor mm -hmm. because of the, uh, the lessons that, that sometimes poverty um, and, and, uh, can give. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's not just uh, being without money, but sometimes the lessons, I think mm -hmm. Dorothy Day said that the, 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 how, how important it is the, the lessons we can get from from the poor yes. in, in terms mm -hmm. of being a, a human. Mm -hmm. I want to thank mm -hmm. you so much for being thank with you, us. Don. Murphy, thank God bless you. you. And God bless Continue you, Continue on the path to healing. Thank you, Don. Ed, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. You're a lovely couple. Thank and you. thank you for being with us on Every Church of Peace Church. How long?